very welcome to join us this morning. Let's stand and sing these great words together. Stop. 
please take a seat. They never get me to do Oh, it's all on Michael, it's okay. <laughs> I don't do this very often, so I wasn't told press the button. If I was told press the button, I would have pressed the button. Okay, good morning. You're all very, very welcome to our service this morning. If you're watching at home, now you can hear me, hopefully, and uh, I hope you're feeling cool. Maybe you have a fan on at home and uh, a cool drink of water. The rest of us have got masks on and are a wee bit stuffy in here. Uh, but whether we're at home or, or here or separated with distance or not, uh, we just pray that this service will be encouraging for everyone um, and that we will love Jesus more because we've met together in one way or another this morning. Um, if you're visiting with us, you're very welcome. I know that we have uh, some, well, they're not special people, but they are kind of special. We've got the Vogans with us this morning. Do you want to give everyone a wee wave? I don't know the Vogans personally. I've just heard about you all. Yes, we'll give them a wee clap. And actually, you'll give them another round of applause when you hear what they've just done. They've just finished 10 days in isolation, yes? In a holiday inn at Junction 1. Oh, doesn't sound like a holiday, but well done. That trial is finished with. So we hope that you can enjoy getting settled into life here in Northern Ireland. And I look forward to talking to you in person, not from the front with a mic. Um, yes, uh, we've got some... Uh, very adoring parents here looking forward for uh, their daughter to be up on stage or, or taking part on stage today. And I'm not just talking about my mum and dad who've actually joined us today, but you're very welcome too. No, we've got the Shields and the Lennoxes and some extended family too. And it's lovely. We can't wait to celebrate uh, and give thanks for Rosie and Pippa, who are not babies anymore, but you'll see that anyway in a minute. Uh, we are, I have a very happy news uh, for you. Little uh, Joshua Hall was born on Thursday morning. Um, there he is, very newborn. Um, we wish, uh, we'll just send all our love to Derek and Kathy, to Ada and Timothy and their extended family too. And I thought that maybe we could just pray for them now while they're in our minds. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the safe arrival of baby Joshua. And we pray that as he adjusts to life outside the womb, you would help him grow strong. We pray for healing and rest for Kathy as she adjusts to life again with the newborn, alongside the demands of parenting to other young children. Would you give Derek the wisdom and energy he needs to meet the needs of his family right now? Please help Ada and Timothy adjust quickly to life with a baby brother and fill them with love and kindness for their new family member. And may the whole family know your peace and patience. May they also know the support of their church family. Show us how to love them well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've already joined in singing together this morning and we thank Stevie and the band for all that they've prepared. Um, and Gilbert's going to be speaking to us from Luke chapter 11 later and that continues our series of Meals with Jesus. We do thank them for all their preparation and their ministry to us. And just before we go any further, I thought we could maybe pray again and just kind of settle our own hearts and prepare our own um, hearts for uh, worship this morning. So let's pray again. Heavenly Father, you are all knowing seeing what we say, do, and think in secret. Nothing is hidden from your sight. We think on the week that's passed and know that we have sinned against you. We want to thank you for your mercy and your unfailing love. We lean on your great compassion and thank you that through Jesus you can blot out the stain of our sins and wash our hearts clean. As we meet together this morning, would you renew a steadfast spirit within us? Restore to us the joy of our salvation and make us willing to obey you. Cause our hearts to be glad, our voices to sing your praise, and our lives to tell others of your love and goodness. May we make your name great in this place and in our homes this morning. Amen. Now, enough of my chat. You're going to watch a wee video. Good morning. We're the Lennoxes. I'm Simon. I'm Amy. And this is Rosie. And we pray that Rosie would experience the reality of these words from 1 Peter 1, verses 8 to 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. 
Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Hi, Glen Abbey. This is Johnny and Becky Shields, and this is Pippa Shields, and she is 13 months old now. She is full of fun. She loves walks. She loves adventures, and she's very independent. Um, Johnny is going to read a wee Bible verse for her now. This is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> bye bye. Well done. Do you want to give them a big clap for doing those videos? <laughs> Yes, we call these baby Thanksgivings, but I think we can clearly say these are not little babies anymore, not sit on your knee and stick, stay still. And so no mean feat that they got those videos taken. I think uh, the Shields had a little help from that dog that wasn't their own, did it? Is that right? No, that dog just <laughs> ran into shots. So I don't know if that was helpful or not, but it was great um, to see the wee girls. And they're all here this morning and we'll get you to stand up in a wee minute. But these parents became parents in the midst of Really, really strange times. Little Rosie was born just a month before, is that about right? About a month before our, the pandemic uh, struck. And then Pippa right in the middle in June, just after it. And so when they've experienced the very harshest and strictest of the restrictions with a newborn and it's stressful enough becoming a parent. So these guys have done really, really well um, in all they've done. And I'm sure that it's been filled with joys in the slower pace of life and the and the family bonding, but then the stress of not being able to see family and do the things that um, normally would happen. I'm sure that's been stressful and disappointing at times too, but isn't it good that in all things we can trust um, that God works for the good of those um, who love him? Um, so we are really glad to give thanks to them this morning. Now, I couldn't help myself. I'm in kids, so I brought a prop. What did it bring? Will I manage it with a mic? I wonder if anybody knows what this is. Sophie, you might know what this is. What's this, Sophie? Do you know? What is it? You're right, it's a big apple. Now, why on earth did I bring a big apple with me when I was thinking of giving thanks for these little girls, Rosie and Pippa? Well, I wonder if who knows what's right in the middle of an apple? What's right in the middle of an apple? What? A worm? Th thanks, Dad. It's not a worm. No, might have known. Never bring your father when you're at the front. Right, no, it's not a worm. What's right at the middle of an apple? Yeah, the core, and in the core there are seeds, and the seeds are called pips. And we've got a wee girl called Pippa. So I thought of the pips inside, and it's not that tenuous, is it? No. I thought of the bips inside an apple. And I was thinking in kids ministry, we often say that we are sowing seeds into the lives of the children when we're teaching them the Bible. Is there a greater gift that we can give to our children than sowing seeds of God's word, opening the Bible with them in church, but at home too, as often as we can. You're right, Rosie, you want this, don't you? And uh, I think that it's just that children, you know, they're, you got, went, to, went to the bother of going to a stream to read, you know, who leads me by streams of water and all those things. And Pippa, Pippa looked like she was just distracted with a dog or eating a stone. Yes, we all caught that. But um, actually, you're never too young to hear these words and to plant these seeds. So keep planting the pips. That's the first thing. And then I wonder if anyone can tell me what color is my apple? Go on. Go on, Finn. It's red. Some might say, rosy red. Yes, it's rosy red. It's really lovely. It's good to eat. It's really appealing. It's become a beautiful, uh, what was once a beautiful seed has become a lovely piece of fruit. And as parents, we all kind of hope our children will grow into polite, respectful, law-abiding citizens. Yes, we'll agree with that. But don't all parents want that? 
As Christian parents, don't we want what Simon was reading out, that our children would grow to love Jesus and to be saved by Jesus and to become really good fruit. And all those good deeds that they do, they shine out of a heart that's been transformed by Jesus. So maybe it was a tenuous link, but we have our apple. Remember to sow the little seeds. There's never too young to open the Bible with our children. And we pray that Jesus would grow those little seeds into really, really good fruit. Let's pray for these guys. Now, do you want to stand up? And actually, maybe if you're brave enough, give us a wee wave or get the girls to give you give a wee wave. Johnny, you have to stand up, even though bass players don't always like to be on show. That's what you get for not standing down there with Becky and helping out. <laughs> Lovely. Let's pray for these guys now. Creator God. We praise you for the wonder and joy of creation. We've enjoyed the heat and light of the sun over the past few weeks and it has highlighted the beauty of our surroundings and given us glimpses of your glory. And today we give you thanks for the miracle of new life, for the precious gift that Rosie and Pippa are to their families. We thank you for the beautiful and busy little girls that they are and for the joy that they bring to Simon, Amy, Johnny and Becky. Thank you for their presence here in the wider church family, reminding us that the church is made of many parts and that we need each other, even our youngest members. We thank you for the privilege of parenthood and ask that you would surround these families with your love and truth. May they love opening your word and talking with you together, growing in love for you and each other. There are so many phases of parenting. As these girls explore and find their voice and test boundaries, would you help Simon, Amy, Johnny and Becky to parent in such a way that Rosie and Pippin know what it is to experience discipline and correction alongside love and grace. And Heavenly Father, we ask that you would cause these little girls to seek after you, their Lord and Saviour, and that, you, uh, that they would choose to serve you, the one true living God with all their heart, soul, mind and strength. We thank you for your presence with us this morning and for listening to our prayers. Amen. Now, we're going to all stand together now. I need Ian, you're going to come up, and Gareth, you're going to come up, and Lila and Finn, maybe. Oh, good, we've got them all. Got the whole guy, and they're going to come up because they're going to help us with some actions. So everybody up on our feet, we're going to sing Jesus' love is very wonderful and start singing these truths to each other, to our children. And we're never too old for these, are either, are we? Right. Great job, everyone. Uh, let's continue to give thanks for God's loving kindness as we sing these words drawn from Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever.
Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your goodness and your grace upon our lives. Forgive us, Lord, for when we put our trust and sense of worth in anything beside you, whether that be in our jobs, our abilities and accomplishments, our families, or our own self-righteousness. Our value has been fixed and our ransom has been paid at the cross. Lord, help us to find our worth in knowing Christ alone. was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, Now then you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, 
the inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, they're not the one who made the outside make the inside out you. But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you Pharisees because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the, the former undone. Woe to you Pharisees because you have the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you because you are like unmarked graves with people walk over without knowing it. When Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and began to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him out in something he might say. Morning, everybody. What a great morning. That was so well read with all the sound effects. And Rebecca, superb job. Apples will never be the same again uh, for me. And... Uh, uh, Peppa and Rosie, just uh, that, that, that's amazing. And of course, I have a personal interest. What an amazing gift to be alive, to be able to give thanks for the birth of grandchild number eight, the gorgeous wee Rosie. So that's just a wee personal plug. So I'm sure um, you'll excuse that. This meal that you've heard about with Jesus did not end well. I wonder if you've ever been at a meal which ended up in a blazing row, and people not speaking to each other anymore. I hope not. But this is one of those meals. It's a watershed moment in the Gospel of Luke, in the opposition of the religious leaders to Jesus. So it's a crucial meal. Luke tells us a Pharisee invited Jesus for dinner. Now, the Pharisees were a special sect or group within Judaism. It's likely that their name derived from a word meaning set apart, and they certainly were. They were particularly noted at this time for being meticulous in adhering to their own very strict and very detailed interpretation of Jewish law. They were not merely theorists or academics. They were practitioners. Indeed, they were very public about their religious practice. A Pharisee invited Jesus for dinner, but not just Jesus. We discover that experts in Jewish law had also been invited, the academic theologians. In addition, there were other Pharisees there. A Pharisee invited Jesus to dinner, but this was no dinner party. This was more like a setup, an ambush, an inquisition. So two questions. Why did the Pharisee invite Jesus? And why did this meal end so badly? Well, the initial trigger for the invitation was that Jesus healed a man who had been unable to speak. And the man immediately began to talk. It was unmistakable public physical evidence that Jesus had healed him and that Jesus was the Messiah. But some present refused to read the evidence that way. They claimed instead that the source of Jesus' power was demonic. Others claimed not to be satisfied by the evidence and demanded for more and more signs from heaven. And Jesus then commented, this is a wicked or a perverse generation. There is nothing, of course, perverse in desiring evidence if the desire is sincere from a mind and a heart that is willing to go where the evidence leads. But this was not the case here. They were perverse, first of all, in the way they interpreted the evidence. Even though the miracle was self-evidently good, it was restorative, it was glorifying to God, they claimed it was demonic. And they were perverse also in asking for more and more signs. Because what would another miracle have added to the evidence? They already had the evidence they needed. How many signs would have sufficed then? Their seeking of more and more signs, more and more evidence, was not an indication of willingness to believe. It was an indication that no matter 
how much evidence they were given, they had no intention of believing. Now, why had they become so perverse and so wicked? And to explain this, Jesus spoke to them about what he called the eye of the body. The eye of the body, which is our human God-given faculty of perception, not simply seeing, but perceiving the significance of what we see. This is designed to function, said Jesus, like a lamp that provides light to the whole house. But if you cover the lamp or hide it in some way, there won't be any light or whatever light you get is going to be insufficient and distorted. In other words, if our faculty of perception is genuinely open, then the light will flood in and we will recognize the evidence set in front of us and respond accordingly. But we can cover it up. We can allow our perception to become impaired and distorted and covered by our prejudice and our evil desires, our greed, and so we cover up the lamp. And it was hearing this that a Pharisee invited Jesus to dinner. What did Jesus mean? What exactly was he implying, especially about them? And he didn't have to wait very long to find out. The Pharisee was surprised, Luke tells us, when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. So with his physical eyes, he noticed something Jesus failed to do. And with the eye of his body, with his perception, he was shocked. Because by failing to wash before the meal, it's nothing to do with hygiene or meal etiquette. This was in the Pharisees' perception a crime against true holiness. So Jesus spoke to him. You Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Now this is a really sad and sobering revelation. Here were people who knew their Bible inside out, the Hebrew Scriptures. They had all the special light that God had provided, but they had allowed their eye, the eye of their body, their perception, to become evil, greed, and wickedness had clouded and perverted their perception so that the light that came from the scriptures was totally distorted inside them. They focused on the practice of piety, on looking spiritual, on keeping up appearances instead of living generously towards others, especially the poor. They had become fools thinking that God would be happy with a mere focus on externals and not a focus on the heart and the inside. And this can happen to those who give themselves to the study of Scripture and to theology. You're probably more used and than happy to hearing me warn about the dangers of not taking time to listen to God's word. Indeed, at the end of chapter 10, the very famous story of the previous meal, in fact, Luke has just presented us uh, Mary and Martha and the fantastic choice that Mary made to sit and spend time at the Lord's feet listening to his word. So he's already made that point of the importance of that. But here he is warning about paying the wrong kind of attention to God's word. The Pharisees prided themselves on hearing God's word. They scrutinized it so that they could attempt to practice it down to the last tiny detail and regulation. But it was devoid, in most cases, of personal relationship with God himself. 
and mere academic Bible study and theology devoid of relationship with God is dangerous as many a young Christian student has found studying theology at university or seminary, especially if he or she is taught by those who don't actually believe in Christ's resurrection, don't believe, therefore, that he conveyed his authority and his truth to the apostles and have no real personal relationship with him themselves. Academic theology might lead to becoming a religious Pharisee or an agnostic or even an atheist, as many are, but it won't lead to somebody becoming a Mary. The Pharisees knew the Scriptures by heart but had allowed themselves gradually to become preoccupied with the symbols and rituals and regulations set down in the Bible rather than with the moral and spiritual reality to which the symbols and rituals pointed. In other words, this talk really, if I were to sum it up, is a warning about how not to listen to the Bible. They made two mistakes in particular. First, in addition to what the scriptures actually said, they added all kinds, hundreds and hundreds of rituals and regulations of their own with the best motive, certainly at the beginning, but things that had no biblical warrant. And then these additional rules became so important in their thinking that if anybody failed to observe one of them, it was a crime against holiness our meal with Jesus. Jesus failed to wash before a meal. This was one of their rituals. How could could he be so ungodly and so unholy as to fail to do this? It was shocking. In effect, the Pharisee considered himself more holy than Jesus, which is always a dangerous sign. If ever you find yourself in a position where you're starting to judge Jesus for being too liberal and lax, and think that you're more holy than he is, you're in a dangerous spot. But it happens. People adding, going further than what Jesus and his apostles taught. I've been in situations where once I was ill and uh, I was actually in hospital, this is years and years ago, and so somebody had to take over the teaching duties in a local church that I had to do. Uh, it wasn't here. It was back in the great, wonderful city of Armagh. And uh, And he told me what he was going to say. And I said, but you can't say that. Now, he was twice my age. I was more bold perhaps those days than I am these days. But I said, you can't say that. Why not? Because the Bible doesn't say that. I know it doesn't, but I'm going to say it anyway. And he did and caused enormous, unnecessary difficulty because he wanted to just go a bit further to add in what wasn't there. There is a mindset, a religious mindset that thinks that Jesus was far too lax associating with sinners and tax collectors. Happens in all kinds of ways. Do you know, it's a very good thing to pray before a meal. It's a good habit. Is it a law? I've been in situations where I know I have been judged because I didn't do it. We develop all kinds of little rules and regulations, little standards of holiness as believers that we not only seek to apply to our own lives, but we want to apply to everybody else. And if the people around us don't do what we do, then somehow they're suspect and they're below our standard of holiness. You know, we're interested in prayer and we discover in the scriptures that Jesus got up a great while sometimes very early in the morning to pray and we think that's the answer so we go and do it we find that it actually does work for us and we share it with some of our friends and some of them do it and find it helpful and before you know it it has become a whole theory and a practice and then we start pushing it and anybody who doesn't quite measure up to our standard of spiritual practice is clearly by definition not spiritual enough you ever been in that kind of context i have and i've possibly been guilty of it as well So many believers then feeling they're not good enough because this particular method just doesn't work for them. There must be something wrong with me. Modern day Pharisee isn't. 
Second major mistake they made was to turn their observance of these rituals into a substitute for true morality and genuine holiness of life. Instead of dealing with their own greed and wickedness, they focused on the externals, on keeping up the appearance of holiness in public. They cleansed the outside of the cup while all the time filling it up with the spoils of their greed and their immoral business practices and the exploitation of the widows and the poor. And the answer, Jesus said, according to verse 41, literally translated, was to give away the contents of the cup. That is, stop their greed and give to the poor the proceeds of their corrupt activities. But of course they didn't. Because as long as they kept up with their rituals and washed their hands when they came in from their business, from the marketplace with all their dodgy dealings, and they washed their hands, then that was fine. Have you ever seen, witnessed this, or felt the pull of it? Keeping up appearance to get other people off your back in case they ask too many questions about the real state of your heart. So we just keep the opinion. We think, now what would they really like to see? Okay, I'll do those things and keep, keep them going. So, and that somehow avoids. And then you get into a whole pattern of living where you focus on doing certain things but without a transformation going on on the end sign. And that can go very deep to the point where thinking that your public performance puts you on some kind of higher plane, which then justifies all kinds of unrighteous dealings financially or sexual immorality or whatever. Woe to you Pharisees because you give God a tenth of your mint and rue and other kinds of garden herds, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. This was another analysis. Unlike their invented rituals that they had added in, like washing before a meal, tithing was in fact part of God's law for the nation of Israel. But the Pharisees' approach to Bible study involved taking one of these commands, and then taking it to an extreme, down to tithing the very herbs they picked in their gardens, but at the same time, neglecting the much more difficult things, the big things, the major things, the important things, justice and the love of God. It's far easier to get your slide rule out and to work out and take a piece of mint and put it down there and work out there's a tenth of mint and we take that. And that's easy because that's external. That doesn't demand any great exercise of morality or spirituality or thinking through what does it mean to be just and loving to my neighbor and how can I love my enemy and how can I act justly in this world. No, you just take the, do the rules. That's easy. And that's what they were doing. They read the command that God gave Israel about not working on the Sabbath day. But how would you define work? So they wrote whole books on the definition of work. And they're still arguing about it to this day. What defines work? So if you walk a certain distance, that's work. But if you only walk half that distance, that's not work. Just missing the entire point the moral and spiritual lessons that were there. They lost, in other words, just to sum this bit up, all sense of proportion. They focused on one little thing that either bugged them or irked them or they could do and used to justify themselves and missed the really big things. That ever happened in church life? or in your life, we end up fixated on this little thing. And if you keep pushing and pushing, yeah, well, I understand, yeah. But you miss the whole point of loving your neighbor 
of loving one another, of bringing the gospel to people, you allow this one little thing to become so big in your mind that it takes over from the really important things. Woe to you Pharisees because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplace. And here Jesus is speaking to their motivation. Even when they engaged in practices which in themselves are good, for example, like prayer, they did it for their own glory. They did it to be seen. They loved position. They loved recognition. They loved public acclaim. Now, either we serve for God's glory or for our own. We can't do both. And what a danger this is, especially perhaps in leadership. Now, the church does need leaders. But every time Jesus touched on the topic in his teaching, he started out by telling people what it shouldn't be like. That ought to be a warning. <laughs> there are massive dangers when we begin to lead others, as I have experienced and encountered and tried to work through over many years. And every context is different. Today, with the cult of personality and the exaltation of charisma over character and the love of the entertainer, the performer, the stand-up comedian, there's a huge temptation for Christian leaders, especially preachers and teachers, to shape themselves from what's working out there. And it's dangerous. Leadership can be intoxicating. The recognition, the feeling of power, the adrenaline rush from speaking to a large crowd, the plaudits, and the danger is you start believing your own press and charisma outstrips character. Once we allow self-glorification to take over, it distorts our judgment. It can lead to manipulation, to focus on creating followers for ourselves rather than followers of Christ. It can actually lead to rank unbelief. How can you believe, Jesus said once, you who receive glory from one another and the glory that comes from the one and only God you do not seek. Woe to you. And this is the, I have no idea where I'm Oh, I'm okay. Within the time still, that's great. I hope you're coping. This is such a warm day. And uh, the fact that some of you actually look as if you're still awake is nothing short of a miracle. So I'm nearly done. Woe to you. Because you are like unmarked graves, he said. He doesn't really mince his words, does he? Which people walk over without knowing it. Now, the reference probably escapes us a little bit. We, we might feel a little bit awkward if we discovered when we're out for a nice country walk we'd actually walked over our graves and hadn't realized it, um, especially those of us who are older. According to Old Testament regulation, if you walked over a grave or you came into contact with a dead body or bones or anything uh, uh, connected. It rendered you for a time ceremonially defiled. And then if you didn't deal with it, you spread that defilement to others. Now, of course, this was just a picture language. It was an illustration, a practical illustration to teach a basic principle that corruption corrupts Corruption corrupts. The Pharisees were like unmarked graves. They were full of dead bones. Corruption. But nobody noticed. I mean, that is, it's amazing. You would have thought that this kind of behavior would have been obvious to everybody. But it wasn't. Instead of people calling it out, they were applauding. Oh, look at so-and-so. Oh, what a man of God he is. Turning a blind eye to his reputation in the marketplace, to how he treats his wife at home, to what his kids have to say. 
they were like these unmarked graves. I wonder if we're walking over any unmarked graves. In these days of, and Chris has talked a lot about it in recent months, digital Babylon, I think he called it. It's a great, great term. On YouTube, for example, you will get every variety of stuff. And of course, if you think this is the most boring thing I ever heard today, you can go on and listen to a whole host of fantastic orators. Some of them are unmarked graves. In fact, some of them have signs of saying, Christian, follow me. And they use the Christian language. But they're basically corrupt theologically and indeed sometimes morally. Are you careful? Because if you're not careful about what you watch and listen to, what happens is you tend to then be looking for the wrong thing. What you're looking for is entertainment, a wee fix. And your spiritual and moral judgment becomes impaired. And you become contaminated by what you yourself are walking over. What do we take away from this this morning? Well, there are a number of challenges uh, for me. I'll just read the things that I thought about. I hope that you'll take the time to read these woes again. Maybe wait till the rain starts on Wednesday before, you know, you know, because the sun is shining. <laughs> but number one is this. Our capacity for religious self-deception is far greater than we think. Our capacity to deceive ourselves when it comes to spiritual life is much greater than we think. Think the Pharisees didn't intend to turn out the way they did, and of course, not all turned out like this. They began with a motive of honoring God, they ended honoring themselves. So, that's that's challenge number one. Am I deceiving myself in some way? And as an extension of that, when you start thinking about this, I find it quite hard to think through because I find it a lot easier to point out how my parents' generation got this wrong. Do you know? I mean, I look back to experiences of church growing up and all the fights about, you know, short hair. Men were supposed to have short hair and then on the arguments, certainly in my church background, yours is very different. The arguments were about how short short hair would be. And, and women were to make sure that they didn't wear short skirts. But how, how short a skirt should it be before? And the huge amounts of energy, rules were written by some to govern all this stuff. And I could look at that and smile and, and so on. And maybe you didn't have that experience. But what am I doing? What does this generation do in this area? Answers on a postcard, please, or in this modern age, on an email, please. It would be really interesting to see what are the things we do to cultivate phony spirituality. Number three, I need to regularly check my sense of proportion. It's one of those things that that when you get older, uh, and most of you won't have experienced this, but I'm experiencing this, you tend to get a wee bit cranky. You ever noticed? You just get a wee bit cranky in the air, and little things annoy you. And they annoy you far more than they should. And we can easily allow, I can easily allow this, little thing. You know, the neighbor that, that's out with a strimmer just when I'm trying to have my quiet time. And of course, he deliberately did it when I'm having my quiet time. He knew, or the devil knew. And it's such a big thing that you forget all the good things that the neighbor did and does. And you just get life, that's just a silly example, but you know the kind of thing, we get cranky. Our sense of proportion, and we get all het up about certain things, 
and we neglect the love of God, our neighbor, getting the gospel out and justice, treating people justly, I should say. I wonder, each of us, check our sense of proportion. What is really important? And am I spending too much time on things that aren't really important? And finally, let's not impose on each other our definitions of holiness especially if they're not in the Bible. <laughs> Don't make lists of things that are your definition of a spiritual life and then judge everybody else who doesn't meet your high standard. Be very careful with what measure you judge, Jesus said, you will be judged. So just don't do it. Rather, let's seek to encourage one another to love and good works and all the more as we see the day drawing near. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the uncomfortable power perception of Jesus' words to us. And may we allow the searching beam of this to come into our own life. I pray that our own perception is not distorted by baggage of tradition or personal desire or our own greed and wickedness and selfish pursuits, but that our, the perception, the eye of our bodies might be open to allow your light to come in and to shine in the dark corners as part of the process of changing us and making us more like yourself. Use your word in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Let's start again.
and standing as we pray. Father, we thank you uh, for these moments when we've been able to uh, celebrate uh, the joy of new life amongst us, uh, celebrate the return of some of our missions family together, and allow ourselves just to take the time to listen to your word. And Lord, we thank you for the challenge that is, and we pray that each of us would focus and look at our own perceptions and that we would hold firmly to you. We thank you for this great song that we've been singing, that you are our hope in life and all that that brings, the joys and the sorrows, and also in death. So we thank you for the hope that we have, and we pray, Lord, that you will continue to speak into our hearts and lives and that we would not lose sight of your promise to be with us every step of the way. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.